Perhaps I'll start with you, Alan. You finished by talking about the federal budget. Ten days ago, Scott Morrison handed down a budget in which he allocated $30 million to AI. What did you think about the package and was it anywhere near enough? Uh, I think I referred to it as being a first instalment or a down payment. Uh, it's not possible to spend in Australia as much as would be required to make us an absolute leader. I was struck to see Alibaba, you, you've all heard of the company Alibaba, they said last week that in the next three years they're going to spend $13 billion, US, $13 billion in AI research across seven research centres in four countries. Uh, so there's a lot to be done. We need to be able to participate, to be a player. It's unlikely we can be a leader. The most important thing we can do is educate our workforce so that we can attract um, foreign companies to set up R&D here so that we can be a player and export um, uh, products that we make. Part of that is having the research capability to train the educators. So the budget actually was very, very good for science last year. There was, uh, sorry, last week. There was $200 million a year for the next 12 years promised for the large scale, the national scale research facilities that underpin our ability to do research. And uh, I'd say the scientific community is jumping for joy on that one. And the second thing that was important was the change of thinking. So for the last six years, we've been trying to get that kind of funding and the government hasn't seen its role. Uh, the government felt that states should pay and universities should pay. But the government has absolutely accepted that the Commonwealth government has to pay for national scale research facilities and that there's got to be a long term planning process. And we've, we've won on both fronts. Uh, substantial funding for research, not just what I mentioned, but other things, a genomics research project and a Great Barrier Reef and Antarctic research project and a change of thinking. Thanks. Anyone itching to ask? Otherwise, just a quick follow-up, if I may, because um, and we've got our first over there. Let me finish mine, then. Then, then I'm going to hand the rest of the time over to the audience. Richard, you were talking about too many passives, which is just a sort of follow-up, really, to what Alan was just talking about. Why are we behind? Or, put another way, will we ever, really, ever be able to catch up? Uh, it's a great question, um, and you know, we really, it was an attitudinal. Uh, Piece, which I think, you know, when we look at uh, corporate Australia, I, I do wonder whether we've become a little bit frightened, uh, you know, what might happen if we get it wrong. Uh, and I know a lot of companies have spent a lot of money on big data uh, and not got an awful lot out of it. So I think there's two factors there. One is that sort of risk aversion, a little bit of uh, boardroom sort of apathy slash, you know, don't want to get it wrong. And then the second piece, you know, is, is that idea around, uh, you, know, you know, how do we actually make this work? So. Look, I think in terms of how do we change attitudes, I think a lot of it's by showing success, showing it can work. I think the government can take a leadership role in some areas, uh, but ultimately it's also about really uh, highlighting the great research that is happening in some of our universities. Uh, and I think for me, AI is one of those areas where the, 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 uh, the relationship between business and university, you know, and Sydney Uni being a sponsor today, you know, it is actually really important. This isn't just theoretical research that might or might not have application. This is real stuff. It's really important. Uh, and, you know, my company, we've, we've developed relationships with the numerous universities because that is where the, the cutting edge of AI is. So ultimately, to me, it's, it's about actually a partnership between business and, and academics uh, and making sure that we've got a common agenda. Can I just add to that? <clears throat> so I, I think in some respects, it's, it's also about confidence. So I think Australian businesses need to actually do more promotion about the type of work that they actually do. So the example that I gave about the engineer offshore, that was done almost three years ago at Woodside over in Perth. So the stuff's not new. Like, organisations have, have actually been dabbling and creating programs around artificial intelligence for quite a while. But I just don't think that they do... Well, Woodside's made a video, but... Um, but um, I just don't... Th I just think we can do more to actually help promote the advances that our organisations have made here in Australia. Thank you. We have a question over here. Uh, Peter Leonard from Data Synergies. Um, one of the things that um, uh, I think was on Richard's slide pointed to uh, processing power, uh, data 
um, uh, volume of data and skills as critical enablers for AI. If we look three or four years out, to what extent can you see those things being available as utilities or uh, otherwise as shared resources such that the AI landscape will not be a scale game. It's possible for AI startups to get a leg up in Australia through using um, processing as a utility or otherwise accessing shared resource. I think that's a great question. Uh, I think the, there's really good news on that front. There is uh, an enormous wave of uh, democratisation of AI coming. Um, I think the, the challenge we have right now is that the tools that have been open sourced or made available by the big companies only get you a small part of the way. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that is limiting startups and early stage companies from really embracing AI or real AI. Uh, and so I think it's really important that, that over the next few years we do push that more tools are, are made available, particularly to smaller companies. Um, because I think one of the risks we run is that the very big American companies have had such a head start that they run away with the game. And so I think ultimately it's important for countries like Australia, but also businesses like every, everyone's business in this room, that we can actually access the tools and the toolkits. Uh, and companies like Amazon, to give them a, a plug, you know, they, they've got quite a number of, of uh, tools that have, they've made available in their suite. Uh, the IBM Cloud has the same, Microsoft and all the others. But we're not there yet. And so I think it's a very pertinent question. We need more tools. Can I just quickly add to that? Um, Companies like IBM are making now dedicated chips. So instead of having a general purpose microprocessor to do all the work and all the AI and you need thousands of them to do difficult algorithms, they are making chips that for things like image processing, on one chip you can do what you might need a thousand cores or you know, a thousand processes of general purpose computers and that's going to transform things as well. And the more we can get all that power into say your phone or your um, Alexa assistant at home, the more likely that we can do processing in your home or on your phone instead of sending it back up to the cloud for processing, which makes it easier to manage privacy. So I think it's going to converge in the right direction, because, partly because of technology. Thanks. We have a question here, and I can see someone else wanting to ask a question, and another one here, so they're lining up. Thank you. It's uh, Damien Graham from First Aid Super. I just had a question for, for uh, any, I guess, on the panel, just around uh, the confidence the panel has in the ability for us to protect against cyber attacks and, and threats to the data that will be impactful or really important to driving the AI future. Um, protecting ourselves is almost more important than anything else. Um, it's one of the areas, a little bit like health, that Australia has done very well especially just in the last couple of years. So we now have a cyber security growth centre, we've got the Australian Signals Directorate, we've got um, like a commissioner for cyber security and across the federal government and the state's go state governments, they're working in a fairly coordinated way to uh, come out with solutions that are repeatable solutions that can be embedded in hardware and working with the Americans and others to do that. So there is progress on that, but it's, it's, um, it's a, a battle you can never win, you're always trying to stay ahead of the threat. But there's a lot of coordination going on. Just, just to build on that quickly, the, um, one of the uses for AI is actually in um, PCI reduction, which is taking the, the personally identified information out of records. Um, and because you don't necessarily need the personal identification to train the machine. So a lot of it's got to do with the data architecture, uh, wh where, where you put the data and, and in what format. So there's, there's a lot of work we do with our clients around making sure that the big data stores don't have personal identifi identifiable information in them. So here, and then the front table. Hi there, Alan Mills from Deloitte. Um, my question to anyone on the panel is one of interoperability of these technology platforms and what the role of government is in making either that happen or we just sit back and let it happen to us. Uh, that's a very big question. Uh, it, it's very important because obviously um, there's kind of a platform war going on uh, between the, la the big American companies anyway, uh, and they're certainly looking to make sure that you know, all of their applications work within their environments and they don't necessarily always work as well outside. So I think certainly that is one of the foundations that we do need to focus on, which is making them interoperable. 
uh, that, that right now they're not that, that they are more walled gardens than they are open. I'll just, from an IBM perspective, um, while we do have our own tool sets, our strategy is really to, to be platform agnostic. So while we have IBM Cloud, our solutions work on Azure, Amazon or AWS. Um, so our, our desire is to actually try and make the access to systems ubiquitous, effectively. Please. Hi, it's Andrew Waldock from Australia Post. Uh, my question, and thank you so much for the information uh, that you've shared today, it's wonderful. The thing for me though, if, if Australia is somewhat behind then as we look to adopt this type of technology, um, the discussion that's been shared, we have the platforms, we have some of the tools, we, we have a lot of the things that will enable us to begin. So for the organisations that are in this room and for the businesses and organisations in Australia, what I'd be interested to hear is your insight or suggestions about how should an organisation begin and get on with it? I'll, I'll start this time. <laughs> so I think in the past, we've seen a lot of examples of where organisations have used the hammer, hammer and the nail principle, where they've gone around looking for nails to hit this new technology hammer on. And usually it's resulted in disappointment or in the case of virtual agents actually getting your um, customer annoyed quicker by automating a really really bad process so the way in which um, I personally look at it is it's finding the right problem to solve pro problem and then working through what technologies will actually give the business the most value in solving that problem that by that way, you've actually got the confidence in the technology that's generated both in company and in market, and then that can be then used to scale the technology within the organisation. Just a quick add on that one. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of Australian companies, big ones and small, uh, and a lot of them do have the toolkits. You're absolutely right. Um, they've, got this, they've got data scientists, they've got engineers. Um, what they're lacking is a coordination, uh, and they're also lacking executive sponsorship. So if what I've seen so far is very few Australian companies have a stated AI strategy. And as much as that is a hammer looking for a nail, this is a bloody big hammer. Uh, and, and I think it warrants a strategy. So I think ultimately um, the, the, the other two things I'd add, which would be don't start with a chatbot, please. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, because that's not going to end well, uh, the second piece is I mean, I'd, I'd really focus on something that has a customer impact first. Uh, as much as if people talk about automation and cost out, I, I think the real value is going to be in the insight uh, game and, and gaining that better insights. And I think that's where uh, it's very easy to communicate to the whole company and get buy-in once you've got those additional insights. I know we're short of time, but I just wanted to add to that. I don't think any Australian companies have the capacity of, say, a Google or an Apple to do it all themselves. So collaboration is really important. People often think of collaborations between companies and universities. That's important, but company to company. So what country, when you think about it, which country do you think has the most advanced autonomous vehicles and has had them for the longest time? It's Australia. It's out on the mine sites, the haulage trucks out in the Pilbara. And that was done by Rio and BHP, working with Caterpillar and other companies from Japan and America and working with UQ and U Sydney. And they just brought it all together because they had a very clear problem that they wanted to solve. It was not just cost, but safety and environmental benefits as well as cost. They had a very clear goal in mind and they just drew in those capabilities and they coordinated. They had executive commitment and they coordinated. I think it's a stellar example and you can do that at all different sizes, at all different scales. Sadly, we've run out of time. It's our pledge that we get you out of here by two o'clock. So at this point, I will um, ask Peter Wills AC, who is the, uh, a member of the CETA Board of Governors, to propose a formal vote of thanks to our speakers. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>